Hello and welcome to Music Support's fifth birthday celebrations. My name is Kel Murray. I work for a company called Output Communications and we do PR and comms for the backstage music industry. And I work quite closely with a couple of charities within the industry as well, including the very brilliant Music Support. I would like to welcome today Kiva O'Connell. She works at uh, the OES Centre in Belfast, which is a charitable music hub. Um, really interesting backstory here because you work in youth engagement. Yep. So, Kiva, over to you. Tell us all about your role in music. Thank you very much. So, yeah, um, Kiva O'Connell, I'm the youth engagement officer for the OEM Music Centre and um, a little bit about the, the centre itself. It was we had our 14th birthday just a couple of days ago. Um, so we've been going for 14 years right in the centre of Belfast. And as you said, we're a charitable organisation, but we are a live music venue, we're a bar. Um, within our place, we also hold lots of youth projects and we hire some offices upstairs to other independent creative based businesses. So we've got record labels, production companies, festivals organised out of their recording studios and the Joe Strummer rehearsal studios. Um, so we're everything and all things youth club, hangout, um, coffee bar. <laughs> but my job is really to get young people from around Belfast and the north of Ireland and get them in, involved with music. Before COVID, that involved putting on gigs, doing workshops. At the minute, that's all moved online. Um, but really, it's just opening doors for young people and with the specific focus on those that may not already have access to music so those that may not own an instrument those that may not have an opportunity to learn the decks that's what we're for and that's my job <laughs> amazing that is so interesting like what a, what a brilliant concept to have as well um and in an area like Belfast which has just come on so much with its music scene over the last decade I think it's amazing um so we're here today to talk about mental health first aid training um how and why you thought that was something that you wanted to bring in to your daily work and you know develop your your skill set for what you do with, with youth engagement in northern ireland um can you tell me a little bit about why that struck a chord with you and why you wanted to undertake the training yeah, I mean, it was something that um, it came from top level management for to begin with. And when I say top level management, I mean, CEO Charlotte, our boss, who's in the next office and is just like a good friend. But she wanted to lead the way and put us all through the, the, the training. Um, it quickly became apparent that everybody needed it. And I don't just mean in the sense that we were doing anything particularly wrong, but because of lockdown, because of the, the new working situations, the new circumstances, the new style where we had to deliver things, um, it became more useful than we ever thought it would be. I initially thought it would help me in my ability to connect with young people and with my colleagues. Um, and it became a lot more than that. It helped me in my home life. It helped me with new roles that I found myself in both professionally and personally during the pandemic. Um, and it ended up being a lifeline, um, both professionally and personally. Um, have you used it during lockdown um, with any with any of um, the youth that you work with that you've been able to you know see a change and see some kind of recovery? Yeah, there's one youth group. So I do a, um, a mentorship program called Volume Control where we take on a group of teenagers and over the year we mentor them in the behind the scenes of the music industry. So um, how to book an act, how to set up a stage, how to do sound engineering, you know, everything except for the musicians. Mm -hmm. um, that was always a very practical thing and we had to move it online. So the 2020, 21 year, they haven't done a gig with people. They've only done pre-record stuff, but there was one individual on, on the group and I just noticed that she began to kept, keep her camera off during um, a Zoom meeting. She would still attend, but she would have, have her camera off um, and her contributions just began to, you know, just drift away where she used to be quite vocal and um, have lots of great creative ideas. She was just more quiet. Um, 
And I didn't actually want to tell her to, to put her camera on because I don't like to put my young people under that pressure. Um, I know what it's like when you don't want to appear on camera. But then um, I just said at one of the meetings, at the end of one of the meetings, you know, if anybody is struggling, kind of like what you said, you know, if you want to reach out, but, you know, I am their designated child protection officer. They're under 18. So I did it in a way where it was like, um, I would love to hear if there's anything that's bothering you. Please know that you can talk to us. It's a great way to come to me individually. And we do have the kind of safeguarding setups where they can contact me in a safe way privately. So this girl immediately after the meeting sent me a message and just opened up that she was going through some personal difficulties. And I think prior to my mental health training, I would have tried to fix those mental health. I would have asked her probably prying questions like, you know, or relationships with parents, you know, all this kind of stuff that I know my mom or I've seen other people do. And it wouldn't have helped. It would have been like, oh, I know how to fix you. Don't worry, we're going to sort this out. Whereas instead, I just went through my stages that I've done with Norman and training and thought, okay, you know, how's the best way to, well, the approach was the, in the, um, in the group by saying, you know, and I think she knew that I met her, but it wasn't personally at her. So I was able to advise her and, and, and support her in a way that wasn't what given advice, if you know what I mean, it was just, I'm here for you. And what happened was she ended up not actually needing it to go much further, but just me acknowledging, is there anything we can do? We're here to support you. I've noticed. And then what I did was tell her, you know, your contributions are really valuable to the group. We really enjoy having you here. When we notice you're not there, we miss you. Um, and now she didn't come back with anything very profound, but a couple of weeks later, her mom sent me a text and just said, I just want to thank you for that because it, it made a real difference. And she came off the call and came and spoke to us and told us what you'd, what you'd spoken about. And it makes us feel so wonderful to know that there's support outside of the home, not just for us. Um, so that was one way that I used it. And then my boss and I actually share um, the responsibilities of keeping an eye on that group. And my boss had seen my response in the chat and said, you know, that was a really, really great way. And you can see how you've used your training to handle this young person and their difficulties. And I mean, nothing to do with me, but just on, on, a, on a positive point, she's back fully engaged in camera on being creative. Um, but I like to feel that she was supported rather than told off for missing sessions or told off for, you know, what's going on with you? Why are you not here? That's three sessions you haven't had your camera on for. Instead, it was like, okay, I recognize that this could be something more. Is there a way that I can help you with this? So as a result, she was welcomed back with open arms when she did feel a bit better. And the group now know how to handle that kind of a situation. We, we dealt with it together and it, it brought everybody a bit closer together, even if it was through Zoom. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That's such a good outcome. And I think that kind of makes the point perfectly that, you know, mental health first aid is, is the ability to recognise when a problem may be occurring and, you know, preempt it before it gets to any kind of crisis point. And it's exactly what you just said. It's that comfort blanket, that reassurance, that um, destigmatization of mental ill health because we've all got it you know sometimes it's okay sometimes it's not it's mm -hmm. like anything else so to be able to talk about that the way you would you know a headache all right what if it's an anxiety headache what's making you anxious you know that that kind of thing being able to recognize um is just really powerful mm -hmm. knowing what you know and having seen a good result from your own small bit of training what do you think the importance of a charity like music support is especially during and no doubt post pandemic yeah i think it's vital i mean not my work is with young people um and often not just with those behind the scenes but i work with a lot of young music musicians as well uh, you're talking about people that are you know, 16, 17, and suddenly finding themselves in bars um, around situations that maybe they all otherwise would not be in, especially if your band's quite good, you're going to get these opportunities quite early on. You're going to be pushed into situations that 15, 16, 17 year olds aren't normally in. So 
I am hyper aware that the young people that I work with are sometimes more vulnerable to situations that could affect their mental health. So one thing that musicians often talk about is, you know, dealing with the high of coming off stage and immediately wanting to drink or to take drugs or to do something that either helps them process the feeling of having that met much, as we talk about energy from a crowd, I believe that you, you kind of feed on that energy, but there ha we have to teach the young people a healthy way to deal with that energy afterwards. Um, I know and for somebody that's been going to sneaking into gigs since I was 14, 15, I've seen the dangers of alcohol and drugs. I'm now in my thirties. I've watched those musicians who never dealt with those issues properly or never actually addressed their mental health and used drugs and alcohol as a way to self-medicate with their mental health. Um, you know, people deal with their pain whatever way they have to. Um, and, and, and there's no judgment around that. However, I want to teach the young people that I work with early on that healthy ways to deal with stressful situations. So when you come off stage, you know, yeah, when you're a bit older, there's nothing wrong with having a celebratory beer with the band. But, you know, that that delve into extreme, one extreme high to the next. When you're on tour for a few months and away from your family and you're isolated, then suddenly you're back at home and you're expected to just do the dishes and take the bins out. You know, those also are extreme highs and extreme lows that up until fairly recently, I don't think that people actually thought that musicians should be helped in that way. You know, oh, you're, you're on tour. Oh dear, how sad, Never mind. God help you while I'm at home with the kids. But actually that's a really challenging situation to be away from your family and to live one life. And then to suddenly come home and be expected to just slot back into this entire thing. So with the mental health awareness course and with the training that I've done, um, I hope to put the young people that I work with through the training themselves so that not only can they recognize behaviors um, and strategies, but then that become, become, uh, becomes a culture and builds a community. So that if you have the guitarist in a band, it's like, guys, you know, da 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 da. I'm actually going to do a wee bit of meditation after the gig tonight. You know, does anybody want to join me? You know, it might seem far fetched, but I'm starting to see those differences. If you can get the young people practicing in their bands at 15, 16, a wee bit of mindfulness when they come off stage, a wee bit of reflection. Hopefully in 10 years time, they're not the ones that are vomiting on stage or having to be carried off or dealing with their problems in a, in a, in a challenging way. So I, I feel like um, I'm putting the work in now so that future future generations don't have to suffer the way past generations did. Mm -hmm. and that, that is such a, a kind of, a not, not a debatable point because I think, you know, we've, we've seen and we understand how, how hard people work, but you're right, like a lot of the general public will think that that's an easy job, you do something fun, you do something creative. Yeah you know why why should we have to bother thinking about you know funding mental health or addiction um facilities programs core services uh, for people who do that but you know look at the mental health of the nation without culture and without live music without the yeah. things that we look forward to in in sociable groups um and yeah you know road crew are often traveling 10 months of the year and dealing with enormous pressures um and you know it, it is a way of life so as much as you know we're working from home and mm -hmm. living at work you know yeah. we, we do that all the time yeah we do that all the time um uh, you know we must protect our road crew because we need live music we yeah. need them to be functioning to to make you know from DIY gigs to arena shows, safe for people to attend and enjoy. Yeah. So to celebrate the charity's fifth birthday and my two years of volunteering and mental health first aid with them, um, me and some friends have got a fundraiser, which is a little bit unusual. It's a cookbook. Brilliant. It's a roadie cookbook. Oh, wow. So this was born out of an idea by my friends Nick and Julie, who have toured the world together and are lovely, lovely people. Um, and some of their crewmates, Athena and Rich. And essentially this book is 
a ton of recipes from roadies that came off tour and while they were experiencing the unknown, the uncertainty of what on earth was going to happen um, last March, April, they all began cooking together and kind of recreating catering experiences Amazing. in their home kitchens. And so basically, the book is a cookbook, but it's also a vessel for us to talk about mental health first aid. And if people want to buy a copy of the book, which is going to be ready very soon, it's going to fund mental health first aid courses for people who would be going out on tour buses to try and ensure that on every bus or as much as possible on every bus in the UK, we've got enough people trained. Amazing. And yeah, hopefully, well, there is some delicious dishes in there. Um, there isn't any banana bread before everyone. <laughs> But it was banana bread gate of April 2020. We've bypassed that. Um, but yeah, I I'm gonna send some to the OER Centre. Oh, I'm prepared. just about to say I will absolutely buy one. Um, I am an avid uh, amateur cook, but um, everybody in the OER loves cooking, and it's something that we share quite frequently like our boss um at the start of lockdown did a cook along video for vegan cauliflower chicken wings um but yeah we we will definitely send us a copy and we'll do a wee video of us doing something for you that would be amazing yeah. kiva o'connell i cannot wait to visit oh, yes, Please do. I've heard so much about it. You are amazing. Thank and you. you're an absolute credit to the youth in Northern Ireland. I feel like the centre should be very proud. And <laughs> just to echo, just to echo what that mum said, you know, it's it's brilliant to know that people outside of the home, which can be stressful places, um, there's the youth getting getting the help that they need. Yeah, when well, you're more than welcome to the OES Centre anytime. And I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.